It's a silent disease that impacts nearly half of American adults and one in five kids. That's obesity. Many struggle in silence or turn to unhealthy fads or trends to manage their disease. I'm Terrell Bailey. Right now, we're taking a closer look at Michigan's obesity epidemic. As we look to tackle this disease from all sides, we're going to be discussing the societal changes that led to a sharp increase in obesity, how medical bias impacts the diagnosis and treatment, and the impact of obesity in kids, lifestyle changes, drugs, and surgical assistance, as well as disease prevention are all ways some can manage or prevent obesity. We'll be looking into those aspects as well. Now joining us now to help dive into this topic is Dr. Molly O'Shea, official spokesperson for the American Academy of Pediatrics. First, thanks for being here with us. Happy to be here. All right, Dr. Molly, I think the first question should be, is America an inherently obese nation? That's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, inherently obese implies that that's something we are naturally tended towards. And the answer to that is dependent on who you are. Some people do have a genetic predisposition to obesity, meaning that the genes that they're born with make them more likely to be overweight. But actually, that's not the truth for most people. Most people don't have those genes. So I would say, compared to other countries, we are no more likely to be obese than other people. Hmm. All right, that's an interesting note there. So how did we go from this thin as in era to a largely obese nation? Yeah, you know what, if we look back over time, go back to like the 1970s, that's really when we began to see this big rise in obesity in our country. And a lot of things began to change then. Things like the fact that we had air conditioning in mm -hmm. our homes. Things like women began to put off having children until they were, were older. Things like we began to eat a ton of ultra processed food, things yeah. like fast foods, foods that are in um, packages and containers mm -hmm. rather than just produce and other foods that we would have to prepare ourselves, yeah. and fast foods. We also started getting a lot less sleep than we used to starting in the mid 1970s. Really? And all those kinds of things combined bring us together to the place where we are now, yeah. where a lot of us are overweight. You know, you mentioned processed foods. <laughs> Why is it that the cheapest foods are always the unhealthiest? Yeah, you know, it takes a lot of money to grow and raise and produce food and then bring it to market About so that point. we can, you know, eat healthy foods. And so fruits and vegetables, things that actually are healthier, and even things like beef and chicken in the healthier forms uh, take a lot more effort, a lot more money to mm -hmm. produce, and uh, a lot more to bring them to market. To package food that is ultra processed is a lot cheaper. Now, I remember the documentary Super Size Me. It came out <laughs> years ago. Yeah. What effect did it have on America or did it even have an effect? Well, I can tell you, it certainly had an effect on that guy. <laughs> let me tell you, he felt lousy, he gained a ton of weight, and let me tell you, his health status went down, down, down. Oh, boy. But I'm not sure it had a huge effect on the rest of us. Mm -hmm. The rest of us saw it, those of us who did or were aware of it, and we were certainly a little bit shocked by the dramatic change that a month of eating fast food could do, especially when it was supersized. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that a lot of us took that that experience and made huge changes in our daily yeah. lives. And overall, those larger portions, I, I think I saw a commercial the other day for a sandwich with four burger patties on it. How does that wow. overall, <laughs> yeah, that's, that was my reaction as well. Overall, how does that play a role in just this obesity epidemic? Yeah, there's been a shift, right? There's been a shift. If you look at a plate from the 1950s and 60s and what was on that plate, mm. the amount of food on that plate was mm -hmm. so much less really? than the amount of food we're used to eating every day. <laughs> you go to a restaurant now and, and you, it's a mountain of food and that's what you get accustomed to eating mm -hmm. so now when you're at home and you're eating less it feels like boy that's not enough food yeah. it's not just the amount of food though that we're eating it's the proportions of food half of our plate should be fruits and vegetables and a quarter of our plate should be a lean protein and a quarter of our plate should be a carbohydrate like mm -hmm. rice or bread yeah. or potatoes but frankly, whether we're eating out or eating in, mm -hmm. that distribution of foods is different. Okay. And so not only is everything supersized, 
but the types of foods we're eating are just off base. You know, sometimes on social media, people, they post a, a picture of their food that they're eating, and sometimes I'll notice it, and I'm like, oh, wait a second, that's two starches. Should people always make sure that they're including a, a healthy vegetable in their diet? Well, that'd be perfect, wouldn't it, Drew? <laughs> Is that what you do every day? I mean, you know, we can't strive for, for, for perfection, right? Yeah. And it's not that carbs are bad. You know, it's not that carbs are some kind of poison to our body. That's just not true. It's really about having a healthy attitude towards eating, mm -hmm. spending more time making our own food rather than eating processed food, and having a balance of fruits, vegetables, carbs, and protein in our diets. And then as far as food deserts, how are they playing a role in our country's overall health? Yeah, I mean, if you want to eat well, but you're living in an area where there's no access to fresh food, that's what a food desert is, right? A place where there are no grocery stores, you know, no markets where you can get fresh food. You don't really have much choice. Yeah. I mean, you're going to eat Doritos and, uh, you know, Takis. Yeah. That's what you're going to eat because that's what you have access to. And as a result, people are really kind of surprised when, when you hear about people who are food insecure, meaning that they don't have enough food to eat, mm -hmm. and yet they're overweight. And the reality is, is that the kinds of foods that they have access to do result in obesity, despite the fact that they may be going without food a lot of the time. All right, thanks so much for that, Dr. O'Shea. Ahead, everyone, we're talking about the medical measure used to diagnose obesity that is being switched up after decades. We'll be right back. Welcome back. For decades, physicians diagnose obesity based on the body mass index scale. It determines how much body fat a person should have based on their height, weight, and gender. Now, last summer, the American Medical Association changed their policy on how BMI should be used as a measure in medicine. They also pointed out its imperfections, noting that it doesn't account for differences across race and ages. Because the BMI is based primarily on the data of generations of non-Hispanic white populations. So we've got Dr. Veronica Sessi here, a neurologist who specializes in obesity medicine, joining the conversation. We appreciate you for joining CBS News Detroit. Thank you. So overall, I guess because the BMI scale was not incredibly accurate and it actually factored in diagnosing obesity, could millions of Americans essentially just be misdiagnosed? So the BMI is not always reflective of an indicative of someone's actual health. Mm. So it was developed in the 1830s by a Belgian uh, mathematician. And basically, as you stated, it's a height to weight ratio. It was adopted in the 1970s. Um, and it's widely used because it is easy. It's, it's a, a quick measure that can be used. And again, it doesn't account for, unfortunately, actual composition. Mm -hmm. So you know, you, we are not distinguishing between adipose tissue, muscle, um, bone density and things like that with the BMI. And again, it, it, it doesn't really account for um, gender, age, and ethnicity. Mm -hmm. So muscle mass also, again, someone can be labeled as obese and they can be very muscular. So scales really also vary depending on ethnicity as well in terms of what's considered obese or not. So it's not a perfect measure. Yeah. It's still utilized. Um, a better measure would be really looking at waist circumference or waist to height ratio because that's more indicative of someone's health. Is there more tissue along the waistline and more visceral, visceral tissue? Okay. Now, studies show that people with higher BMIs will essentially delay or avoid medical care because providers express negative attitudes. So I guess, obviously, delaying, that's not a good thing. Right. Could things become fatal? So, so there's a stigma and a bias, unfortunately, associated with being overweight. Mm -hmm. And that's not just uh, in healthcare. You know, unfortunately, you know, media, occupational uh, issues, school, and you know, it's on every level. And unfortunately, there's, there's uh, judgment regarding this condition where people are assuming that maybe it's a lack of effort or mm -hmm. a lack of, um, of motivation or um, just not eating properly or just not moving. We know that it's so much more complicated. And unfortunately, that stigma is there on multiple levels, and it really deters people from getting proper health care in a lot of situations. So we can, we can frequently see that someone may not be um, addressed properly in terms of their medical concerns, or it may just be attributed to their weight. And we know that there's a lot of impact if someone is overweight, yeah. but we can't, we can't think that every condition is secondary to that. So you know, it's important to look 
beyond that and just make sure there's no additional medical conditions that are occurring and fully evaluate someone. But unfortunately, that stigma is there and that, that judgment and bias is on wow. so many levels with this condition. I guess overall, as a, uh, you know, a healthcare provider, what would you recommend to other healthcare providers mm -hmm. to actually reduce that stigma? Right, I mean, so, so it's important to recognize that this is not something that's self-afflicted, that we have to look at genetics and physiology and, and you know, behavioral factors with this environment social factors, we have to always make sure that there's no underlying medical conditions too that are contributing and associated with someone having gained weight. Um, it's difficult because I myself, as a physician practicing for years, I did not get a lot of formal education when I was in medical school regarding weight management and obesity. And the AMA did not recognize this as a disease until 2013. Wow. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of advances that we need. And it's important that we make sure that we're approaching these patients and, and recognizing that this is not something they're bringing upon themselves. You know, um, there's so many factors that influence and affect where we are with this. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's, there's different ways that we need to approach it and just make sure that we are very patient-centered and listening to our patients and understanding, you know, what they're going through and, and making sure that, that we're advocating for them in different ways. Good tips there. Overall, how do you recommend people educate themselves just overall on their own mm -hmm. individual physical health? So it's important to be aware of, of different issues that you're having, symptoms that you're having, and you know, making sure that you are consulting with your physician and then making sure that you're, uh, again, addressing your medical conditions properly. And really, if it's, if it's an issue where we're concerned about our weight, you know, making sure that we are looking at secondary causes as to why maybe we're gaining weight. Are you going through menopause? Do you have an underlying medical condition? Do you have hormonal issues? Um, do you have sleep apnea? So making sure we're looking at if you've had a sudden change or if there's a genetic issue associated with this, that those things are, are addressed and that you're bringing it to the attention of your healthcare provider. Let's circle back to the person that potentially is feeling biased at the doctor's office. Right, yeah. How do they advocate for themselves? You have to speak up, yeah. right? So you have to speak up. You have to come prepared for your visits also. If you have certain concerns that you have or issues that you want to address, mm -hmm. and if you feel like you may not call those things while you're in the visit, make a list. You know, make sure that you have those different things addressed. But I mean, really, you have to advocate for yourself and speak up. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, maybe you have a family member or friend that can be present, you know. Um, and you have to be comfortable with whoever is managing your care. Yeah. Right, so I mean, you have to make sure that you, you and, and again, some of these physicians, it, it might be a, a bias that they're not even aware, aware of. of. Yeah. So, you know, bringing it to their attention, because again, there's unfortunately bias on all levels with this, right? And, mm -hmm. and very little um, focus on, on the people who are actually going through this. So. Dr. Sessi, do you think more clinics would actually benefit from treating people as a whole not just an idea. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I think it's always important to take a holistic approach. You know, it's how I try to practice. It's how mm -hmm. so many people try to practice. Yeah. And again, it's multiple, multiple facets that we have to look at, you know, aside from just X, Y, and Z symptom causing, causing a condition. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a wonderful model. Um, you know, to make sure everything is, should always be patient-centered. I mean, that's ideal healthcare, right? Yeah. So what advice would you give to your fellow healthcare providers? Again, listen to your patients, you know, make sure that you are, are um, there for them and make sure that you understand the process as a whole, what they're going through. Yeah. It's very intimidating to go into a medical office and right away everything is attributed to your weight, you know, because there, there's so much more to it. So, you know, making sure that we're listening to our patients. Let's say a person right now, they're watching this and they believe that they have a family member who may be obese. What are those initial first steps mm -hmm. do you think that person should take? Really talk to your talk to your physician, you know, and also of course, you know, look at look at the different reasons as to why we are gaining weight, where you are with your weight, where you were previously. Is this something that's new? Does it need to be um, evaluated right away? Is it something that's been a chronic problem? Mm. Um, and again, you know, um, it's more than just lifestyle and habits. You know, we have to always make sure screen for those underlying medical conditions that might be there, and just make sure that we're we're learning about nutrition proper eating, learning yeah. about ways to move, be active, and things like that. You know, unfortunately, 
we become, and Molly touched on this also, we become more sedentary over time and things are supersized. You know, we have larger portions with everything yeah. and just kind of learning what is the appropriate amount that you should actually be eating. How should you be spacing out your meals? What type of diets would be beneficial for you? We don't, I never advocate like a crash diet or anything like mm -hmm. that. It's just learning about nutrition and how to eat properly. Yeah, watching your consumption. Yes. All right. Yes. Dr. Yes. Ceci, thank you all for your thank insight you. and advice. Thank you so much. About 20% of America's youth are obese. Stick with us because after the break, we'll discuss some things parents you all can do to help your kids manage their weight. Welcome back. Obesity in children has developed into a serious problem in the United States. It's nearly one in five children and teens in the country being affected by it. Doctors and parents throughout America are now being urged to take an aggressive new approach against childhood obesity. The U.S. Preventative Task Force says doctors need to intervene starting with kids as young as six. Dr. Zina Al Rufe, a board certified pediatrician, joins us now to break down this topic. So, Dr. Zina, what does aggressive action, I guess, look like for parents? That's a really good question. And it's going <laughs> to vary from family to family. And uh, patient to patient. Yeah. Um, so sometimes it could be um, taking a multifactorial approach, mm -hmm. seeing like, do we need to work on any dietary interventions? Do we need to work on movement interventions? Is there a family history? Is there metabolic or genetic risk factors at play? Yeah. Um, so I think when they talk about being aggressive, is just saying like, we don't, we know that children with severe obesity are more likely to have severe obesity as adults, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so we don't want to just watch and wait and let it happen. Yeah. So we need to intervene now and try to modify what factors we can and help them out earlier to try to prevent later problems. What would you say are those signs to look out for when they're looking at their kids and considering are they obese or not? So we don't want to just look at them physically and um, as you mentioned earlier the BMI is not always the indicator anymore so yeah. it's a kind of a total complex picture that we're looking at. So we try to focus on you know basic habits and see like are we getting daily movement in the day? Are we getting good sleep? How are we doing in school? How are we doing with our friends? Um, how do we, um, what's our relationship with food? Mm -hmm. You know, um, things like that is kind of, we're going to take all of that into account and then we can kind of decide if this is a issue or not an issue at this time. How do you explain that to your child? Let's say they get to the point to where it's starting, you know, it's time to go to the doctor's office. How do we explain to a child this is what's happening? Yeah. So I always like to present it in a more, of a, in a form of, we're going to talk about our health. How are mm -hmm. we doing today? Um, and not like this is your weight and this is what your need needs to be. We don't want to be weight focused at all. We want to look at our overall health and our overall habits and the child's overall goals. What do you want to do? Mm. Do you know? And so when I'm setting goals with my families, I don't give them a weight goal. I may not give them a nutrition like food goal necessarily. I say, hey, what do you want to do? Do you? They might tell me, I want to be able to walk a mile by next year. Nice. You know, things like that. Yeah. So you're starting with those small goals. Yeah. I guess, how does this disease impact your lower income communities across the country? We know that it affects those um, people in lower income households more severely mm. for many reasons. One of which might be like you mentioned earlier in the, sec in the show about food deserts, lack of access to um, fresh fruits and vegetables, lack of resources for preparing those fruits and vegetables. Um, and so unfortunately it does adversely impact those communities more. I, I was going to ask right now if there's a parent who may potentially think that their child is obese, what would you say the first steps they should do right now? I would say take a deep breath <laughs> first. <laughs> Many times parents come in and they're just so nervous and worried because really? they know what can happen later on. Mm -hmm. And I say let's just take a breath, talk to your pediatrician. Mm -hmm. And you can even have that conversation separately without your child present, especially yeah. if you have a younger child. Many times I like to talk to the parents about how they need to talk about food and, and, and movement and things like that in, to their child mm -hmm. and so that we're not weight focused yeah. um, and more health focused. So I like to parent and uh, coach the parents first. What would you say the role genetics and culture plays in uh, childhood obesity? It does play a big role and I think a lot of people don't understand that and when they see um, a child with obesity, they assume the parents are just feeding them bad things. Yeah. But that's not necessarily true. That's part of that bias that we mentioned earlier. Um, cultural roles, genetic roles do play a big part of it. And so we have to kind of work 
on those in addition to the nutrition and movement like we said earlier. All right. Now, Doctor, nearly one in 10 teams worldwide have used what experts call an effective and potentially harmful weight loss products. That's actually according to a new JAMA Network open analysis. It actually looked at studies from the last four decades on the use of those products in teenagers. Now, researchers, they actually estimate that about 9% of teens have used over-the-counter weight loss products in their lifetime. Diet pills were the most common, followed by laxatives and diuretics. Health officials say that these products are risky to both the physical and mental health of kids. They've reportedly also been linked to eating disorders, low self-esteem, depression, and substance abuse in teenagers. I was going to actually ask you about that. Poor nutritional intake and unhealthy weight gain in adulthood both are also associated. Now, the impact of diet culture seems to be harmful to young people. So what can the parents do to make sure that their kids have some healthy eating habits as well as a healthy body image? Yeah, so this is a big thing parents can do yeah. is to help out and kind of try to dispel diet culture. But unfortunately, it's everywhere. It's in our magazines and our newspapers and all the teens are on social media. Like 95% of kids, 13 and up have social media. You're right. So <laughs> they're seeing it everywhere. But at home, you know, parents can first kind of look at their weight talk. Are they talking about themselves in a negative way? Are they talking about being on a diet and trying yeah. to lose weight to go to the beach or something like that, yeah. right? We want to stop the diet talk at home. Um, we also want to have family meals as much as we can. I know we're all busy, but if we can have family meals together, that can help um, you know, create that bonding and that uh, nurturing environment. And we can talk about nutrition and you know, uh, non-pressured way yeah. in that situation. I know imitation is everything with parents and children just overall. Should parents be mindful of what they're consuming for sure, especially when their kids are around? For sure, for <laughs> sure. Like kids, you know, they do what you do yeah. more than what you say to do. So being a, a, a role model of someone who tries to follow those healthy habits that we're trying to instill in them mm -hmm. is a great first step for sure. And so weight loss drugs are necessarily covered by insurance for kids until the age of 12. So how can parents help their younger children safely combat this uh, disease? Yeah. So trying to offer them nutritious options when possible, mm -hmm. when, when they can. Um, moving as a family, so we want to try to get daily movement in. Uh, hopefully kids can get it at school, but yeah. not always. How uh, much time would you say they should probably try to get? Up? 30 to 60 minutes a okay. day. And so if you can do it as like a family movie night, you know, like game, sorry. Family, <laughs> family like uh, activity yeah. night together. Tug of war, there Tug of war, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or dance party, I do that all the time with my kids. You know, just having fun movement all together yeah. is a good way. All right, so the American Academy of Pediatrics also released some guidelines saying that kids 12 and older, that's a, a suggested age for weight loss drugs and even surgery. I mean, on the surface, that kind of sounds a bit shocking, but mm -hmm. I guess, what is the rationale? Well, the rationale is to recognize that those genetic and metabolic tendencies mm -hmm. or uh, predispositions. Wow. So medications aren't going to be for every patient necessarily, yeah. but there are definitely patients who have a genetic predisposition. And no matter how much lifestyle interventions you do, they still are going to develop and continue to have obesity because mm -hmm. it is a chronic disease. So that's where the medications come into play as an additional tool to help us treat this disease. On an average, I'm curious, how often are parents coming to you with this disease yeah every day I'll see a patient really? you know but is it something that's a focus of our visit for the day mm -hmm. not necessarily <laughs> but is it present yes um, so it's definitely there but is it something that has to be acted on every single visit of every no and that's where I think you had mentioned earlier with doctors like you, if they're in for an ear infection you don't need to talk about <laughs> their weight at that visit right <laughs> right yeah <laughs> all right and so because of those long-term effects I guess I mentioned earlier about, you know, when you potentially are trying to starve yourself or things like that. How does that play a, a, a very detrimental role when that person's potentially 35? Oh, yeah, that's true. It's really bad. And they're more likely to have poor self body image, poor self-esteem. Mm -hmm. um, Yo-yo dieting leads to poor health outcomes as well. So we really want to try to shy away from them doing those kind of things and, and not talking about that. So if the parents you know, trying to do a quick fix. Yeah. Again, the kid's going to do what you do, so we want to try to be mindful of that. All right, Dr. Zena, is there anything else you'd like to tell, tell the parents so that they feel empowered when they're talking to their kid's doctor? Yeah, so don't be afraid to talk to your doctor, um, and, and don't be afraid about 
the obesity itself. We do know long term what the outcomes can be, but because we have these interventions, we can help prevent and slow down the um, development of these things. So have no fear. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> have no fear. Doctors are here. All right. Thank you all so much, Dr. Al Rufay. We appreciate you for your insight. Thank you. Keep it here, everyone. Next, we will be looking into how a change of diet and exercise can be used as a tool to combat obesity. As a reminder, before you make any changes to you or your child's diet, please contact your medical provider. For many struggling with obesity, lifestyle changes like following a balanced diet and gradually becoming more physically active is one way to combat the disease. Experts recommend a balanced diet filled with a variety of foods, but avoid foods that are low in nutrients and high in calories. And gradually increasing the amount of exercise to build strength and endurance is recommended to help manage weight. All right, so joining us now to dive further into the topic, we've got Dr. Veronica Sessi, Dr. Ram Neat, a family medicine and obesity medicine physician, chief medical officer at Trenton Total Health Care. And we've also got Megan Duda, she was actually able to manage her obesity with some lifestyle modifications. So Megan, we're putting you in the hot seat first. I guess overall, what options did you implement? Um, I basically went all in. Um, I hired a trainer and she would do monthly like competitions, um, not just who lost the most weight, but inches as well, because that's what we tend to just get focused on is the scale numbers. Yeah. Um, so I, would, I did boot camps with her for about a year and a half and I learned better portion controls um, and just getting back to healthy habits that I once knew not what I grew into when I was in my 20s and having too much fun. <laughs> <laughs> now I guess what was your turning point and then what were those changes that you made were some small were some large break that down for us. Um, my turning point was my health essentially I started to have a lot of different things going on and I didn't like the way that I was feeling anymore and I knew that I was in control of some of those things. So I jumped into that and I guess I, I'm a type A personality, so I went all in, it's all or nothing for me. Yeah. So I just kept going. All right, and then what are some ways that your doctor actually supported you? We've been talking about that throughout the show. So what ways? <laughs> uh, can I, sorry, I don't have a good answer for this. My doctors didn't care. Really? Yeah. All right. So we actually we talked about that a little earlier. I guess what were those things that you felt that your doctor just uh, I guess wasn't really for you? Um, he just didn't seem very knowledgeable in some of the areas other than, oh, you just need to eat healthier, make better decisions. Mm. Um, and for a while, I was feeling really devastated by just the generic answers. And maybe part of me was looking for like a quick fix. But Ultimately, he just said, you know, you got to keep going. It will take longer than you expect. Yeah. And um, but it never was like I was never one of those people that went to appointments where they would say, all right, you need to lose your weight. You need to lose some weight. You need to look better. You mm -hmm. need. It was never a. All right. A so voiced concern. Dr. Sessi, Dr. Ramney, uh, overall hearing that yeah. just yeah. what was going through your mind as soon as she just said that? I'm, I, honestly, I wasn't surprised. Um, obesity treatment is not a large portion of the education that physicians get mm. throughout the years and years of medical school. So I'm not surprised by that. Um, I'm sorry that you had that experience. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And that's probably your first indicator as a patient to find a new physician. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're not bringing it up with you, there's a problem. Yeah. And for you, Dr. Sessi. I agree. You know, I think it's unfortunate. And, and again, it's also a situation where the training's not there also for some mm -hmm. people. So, so there's a lot of situations where we do have people who focus on obesity medicine for that reason to get you the help. Mm -hmm. But it, it's hard. It's very frustrating for a patient when you come in and they indicate, you know, your physician will indicate that A, B, and C is because of your weight, lose weight. But yes. they don't come up with a concrete salad plan for you or anything like cater to you mm -hmm. and you know it's unfortunate it's it's a it's a disservice to our patients but again we can't have that expectation that every physician is trained and has the knowledge to give you those tools so that's why we do have specialists in that yeah. area so now for the doctors I guess for people that are actually looking to lose weight what should they be looking to add in their diet or even take away from their diet my number one rule <laughs> 
is going to be to start with eliminating ultra processed foods mm. from your home and your pantry. Just take it out there first. Mm -hmm. We all spend the most time in our homes yeah. with our loved ones. That's going to be a horrible so for a lot of people. Yeah. Start at home <laughs> and just remove the ultra processed foods, which are high in sugar, salt, um, poor quality fats. Uh, start by removing those. Yeah, Megan, is this something that you did in your journey? Did you start yes. taking those processed foods yes. out? What did you toss out? <laughs> um, I toss out pretty much everything. I lived alone, so it was easier for me to just not have to buy junk for anyone else. Um, yeah. So it was lots of fruits and vegetables was my primary. And then um, chicken was my easy go-to, you know, making sure I had, what, like fist size is the appropriate right, amount of yeah. protein. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then I made sure the rest of my plate was mostly fruits and vegetables with a little bit of carbs. And then for the doctors, for some exercises, what are those simple exercises that people can start implementing as soon as they watch this? Yeah. Walking. Walking. Yeah. Yes. I can't and, agree uh, more. Yeah. Movement. I mean, I, it was surprising to me to know that 10,000 steps a day under that is considered sedentary mm. and how many people are actually getting that. So any type of movement you can implement. I mean, I myself, I, I avoid elevators, you know, take the stairs whenever you can. You know, I think things. it's important, like not everybody can go to a gym. No, not everyone can work with a trainer. You know, right. these are things you have to carve out a lot of time. So home equipment is great, you know, doing things at home um, uh, and then being active, you know, right. whether you enjoy tennis or pickleball or, or you know golf bowling I and mean, anything that gets you moving is yeah. important all right Megan so we've had somebody watching right now they are looking to make those lifestyle changes what do you say to that person um, it's gonna be a long road and it's not gonna be easy so don't expect immediate changes mm -hmm. um, depends I guess on how obese someone may be they may lose some quick weight water weight mm -hmm. Um, but if people need to lose 10, 20 pounds, it's going to be a slower process for them. And just not to get discouraged and take your time um, and just make sure you're buying, you know, healthy food. I was always told to shop on the outside of the grocery store aisles, not down the middle of the aisles. Oh, yeah. oh boy. All right. Yeah. Dr. Sessie, yeah. Dr. Ramney, overall, your final thoughts. Yes. Um, I would say across, you know, most platforms that bring out medical studies, you know, the evidence shows us a couple of things. We know that anti-obesity medications are life-saving, they're life-changing. We also know that when these medications are discontinued or after a patient has had a bariatric intervention, we know that patients regain about two-thirds of their weight over time. Mm. So knowing that, you know, really put your effort in your lifestyle and your habits. You know, start with removing the ultra-processed foods, reduce your alcohol consumption, um, stay active, mm -hmm. just walk. It doesn't have to be this regimen of strength training and being with a personal trainer. Um, those, those are my high yield uh, <laughs> advice for you. I think also it's good for us to look at lifestyle. It's so important in prevention, but we also have to make sure that we're aware that there's other factors that influence this too. So don't be disappointed in yourself if you are doing everything in terms of movement and diet and watching what you do and then you're still not losing weight. There's so many genetic factors, hormonal factors, psych psychological issues, behavioral issues, social circumstances where, you know, we're very fortunate that we do have other options to, mm -hmm. to supplement with weight loss. and like. Like Dr. Remnit said, medication, surgical options. So don't be afraid to explore those things, especially if you are, are maximizing what you're doing and putting in a lot of effort and not getting anything in return. You should really get evaluated and just see what other options there are or what might be limiting your ability to lose weight. All right, great conversation. Thank you, ladies, for sure. Thank you. After the break, everybody, we're going to be exploring other ways to manage your obesity. And as a reminder, before you make any changes to you or your child's diet, please contact your medical provider. Welcome back. We've been discussing the obesity epidemic, its causes and ways to combat it. There's a list of drugs and surgery options that people can also use to help tackle the disease. Joining us now, we've got Dr. Molly O'Shea returning and then Darlene Luth, a person who actually manages their disease through surgery and medication. So Darlene, let's go ahead and start with you first. Just talk to me about your weight loss journey and what exactly led to that decision. Well, um, I was uh, overweight as a child, mm -hmm. and uh, through all of my adult years, I struggled with different programs, uh, trying different diets and mm. fads that were out there. And then in 2009, I went and saw my doctor, mm -hmm. and I wanted some information about uh, the gastric bypass surgery. 
And uh, we had discussed it and she said, I think you're a good candidate, you're motivated, you're determined. She said, I'm gonna recommend you for the surgery. Okay. So in 2009, I, I had the uh, gastric uh, bypass ruin Y and, uh, and that's really where the journey almost began because it wasn't the end all be all, but it was almost the beginning of my weight loss journey because then I had to really uh, follow through on everything mm -hmm. and my life had changed from that point on. Uh, it's not the last resort, it's really the beginning of the weight loss journey. There's mm -hmm. a lot more work to be done and it continues to this day. Really? Mm -hmm. Are you still actively having to manage the things that you eat and maybe even have exercising in your regimen? Yes, um, I am pretty much a gym rat. I do 12 to 14 classes a week. Nice. Uh, and that was part of what led me to have uh, a recent surgery because I was in the gym a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, my weight had fluctuated um, uh, up and down a little bit and I wasn't seeing the results that I wanted to. So mm -hmm. um, I went to my bariatric doctor here, mm -hmm. my local doctor, and uh, we came up with a plan for me to try a short-term uh, dosage of Ozempic mm. because my goal was to uh, lose the weight that I had gained back. Yeah. Um, after 14 classes in the gym for almost a year, it wasn't working. So um, I saw my bariatric doctor. We got on a, a dosage of Ozempic. Mm -hmm. I did that for maybe five or six months, and I got down to my goal, and then I was able to have the um, plastic surgery that I wanted to remove the excess skin that I had been carrying for so many years. Wow, now some common misconceptions about weight loss surgery are keeping some eligible people from taking that step. Now this is actually according to a national survey by Orlando Health, and it found that almost 60% of Americans think bariatric surgery is a shortcut to losing weight, and about 80% believe it should be a last resort. Doctors stress weight loss surgery is just one tool to fight obesity. All right, Dr. Molly, so what can physicians do to clear up some misconceptions in their patients? Well, weight loss surgery is a very effective strategy yeah. to get the weight loss journey started. And I really love the way you talked about it because it is not the end of the journey. It is an incredibly successful way to have weight loss begin. But weight maintenance after that weight loss has happened mm -hmm. is exactly what you've experienced. What we have found is that people who experience really excessive weight gain and then maintain that excessive weight for a period of time mm -hmm. really struggle to lose weight and get back down to a healthy weight. And bariatric surgery is a very successful way to get back down to a healthy weight. The challenge is to maintain that healthy weight after mm -hmm. surgery. Uh, what would you say after you had the surgery, what, were, what was the hardest thing to maintain? Um, I think just the cravings, the food that I used to eat. You know, I was a pizza holic and Chinese and takeout and fast yeah. food. And uh, the day I had my surgery, um, I stopped all that. Hmm. I got into a gym, got a personal trainer. I did whatever my doctor said to do. Mm -hmm. Whatever he said, I did it because I wanted to be successful with this. Mm -hmm. uh, I went a whole year without even having a McDonald's French fry. Really? Uh, but then after that, you have one and then you start thinking, I can handle this. And yeah. you realize really quick, you can't. So it yeah. is, it's a, it's a daily thing. Yeah, and I think that really gets to an mm -hmm. important point about people who, um, who, who get overweight. Mm -hmm. It's as much a physical thing as it is a mental thing, mm -hmm. as it is an emotional thing. Mm -hmm. Now, Darlene, you mentioned Ozempic. A lot of these weight loss medications are not covered by insurance mm -hmm. because it's oftentimes considered cosmetic. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Molly, I guess, why are insurance companies considering this? cosmetic? Well, I don't know that I, I would use a different term. What they're saying is unless you have a different medical condition mm -hmm. like diabetes, um, Ozempic using it strictly for the purpose of weight loss is not what they're covering it for. It was originally put through the FDA through their process of making sure that a drug is both safe and effective. It was put through that process under the auspices of being used for diabetes. Mm -hmm. So now that it's being used for other reasons, it's, um, there's, there are limitations yeah. on its use. So it's difficult to get that medication for those reasons. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of people who are overweight struggle also with some of these um, secondary problems like 
diabetes or prediabetes, which can make it a little bit easier to get that medication. Ozempic and uh, some of the other, Wagovi, these other medications, mm -hmm. do have the added, I'll call it side effect of weight loss, and uh, that is uh, kind of a side benefit, but it wasn't the original reason for most of the medications that, that was put through to the FDA. Mm -hmm. Now, Darlene, you were able to use that drug and basically reach your goal weight. Mm -hmm. Let's say, had you didn't use it, do you think we'd be at this progression level now? I don't think so because I, it's not for lack of trying because I am motivated and I'm dedicated and I'm not a quitter and I, when I go after something, I do it to the best of my ability, there we go. but I just could not make that happen. So in speaking with my doctor, you know, and conferring with her and we came up with this plan that it would be a short term thing to reach my goal so I could have the surgery to remove the excess skin that I've been dealing with you know, for almost 14 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and after that now, I'm, I'm no longer on it. The, the struggle is still there, it's still daily. Um, I, I have to fight it all the time, but uh, I feel like getting over that hump has made it a little bit easier. Well, yeah. And this is the story of most people who are, who are overweight. Mm -hmm. It's not a lack of willpower or a lack of motivation. Mm -hmm. Most people who are overweight are really trying to mm -hmm. lose the weight. They are making genuine efforts. And the reality is that losing weight is hard. Our bodies are fighting us. It wants to retain the weight we have. And so unless you are gonna be dedicated and committed in the ways that you've been, and even when you were, yeah. it was really hard to do it. Mm -hmm. Darlene, for somebody who is sitting here watching this and they're saying, I am afraid to approach surgery for weight loss, what do you say to them to maybe rethink that decision? Do it. I've told everybody <laughs> yes. I come across, do it. Do you it. won't be sorry. It's the best decision that you'll make because yeah. in the long term, you will be healthier. You're not going to be on pills and medication and worry about diabetes and different things. To me, it was so worth it. Right. High five, darling. Amen. <laughs> All right, everybody. So after the break, we'll be looking at ways where you can prevent this disease. Again, as a reminder, before adding any medication to your routine or seeking out surgery, please consult your doctor about what might be best for you. Welcome back. We've talked a lot about obesity, its causes and ways to manage the disease. We've got all the doctors back with us now to talk about things and how you can reduce your risk. So ladies, I assume it takes more than just cutting back on certain foods to reduce your risk of obesity. Yeah, if that were all it took, we'd all be thin across the world, right? It yeah. takes more than that. Um, and one of the things we didn't really have a chance to touch on is how sleep mm -hmm. affects obesity. And if you aren't getting enough sleep, it does contribute to weight gain. So one of the things I wanted to make sure we talked about mm -hmm. was the fact that good sleep habits does reduce your risk of obesity and actually can make it easier to lose weight too. So whether you're a child or whether you're an adult, getting enough sleep each night is important. How many hours? How many adults? hours, Terrell? Right. Ooh, eight. Adults yeah. need eight, mm -hmm. you know. Which and, I don't get. <laughs> right. And kids, <laughs> depends on your age. Yeah. So a lot of school kids spend a lot of time um, on devices, right? Okay. So until you're in puberty, you really need 10 or 11 hours of sleep, close to 11, really. And once you're in puberty, believe it or not, you still need 10 hours of sleep. Wow. And then once you're done with puberty, then you get to that adult amount of sleep, about eight hours. The problem is, is that past puberty is high school, mm -hmm. and I don't know a single high schooler mm -hmm. who's getting eight hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah. And that is around the time that we begin to see the, this weight gain happening. So sleep is a factor that wow. needs to be thought about seriously. So the other ladies, I guess when you all are dealing with those children that are coming to your offices, mm -hmm. are you asking these questions about how many hours of sleep are oh, you yeah. getting and what are those answers that you're hearing? Oh yeah, <laughs> at every well visit we're asking these questions and we're getting the answers that are a lot less than what they should be doing. Really? So right. part of that discussion talks about sleep hygiene like, like Molly mentioned, you know, are you putting your device away? an hour before bedtime because mm. the devices stimulate the brain and then it's harder to fall asleep. So mm. I always recommend putting it away at least 60 minutes before you want to be sleeping okay. and setting up a good sleep environment. And I guess in the aspect from social media, I guess what advice do you give patients and just parents in general? Yeah. 
It's very clear that social media is really strongly correlated with high rates of anxiety, depression, mm. um, insecurities in young kids. So, and also ADD, which is diagnosed so much more now than mm -hmm. it was previously. So the constant scrolling and exposure to images and how it changes the chemistry in our brain. Um, and then that can lead to less sleep, um, reaching for comfort foods. So it's all correlated and social media is a great place to start a conversation with your doctor and with your family. Hmm. All right, Dr. Ceci, uh, overall, final takeaways, what do you think people should be taking away just from this conversation that we've been collectively having together? Well, just to kind of piggyback with the sleep issue, it's not just the amount of sleep we get, duration is important, but the quality too. So we know that um, basically our hunger hormones are affected by disruption of sleep, whether it's that you're waking up due to apnea or waking up, you have insomnia or restlessness when you sleep, uh, or if you have like delayed sleep or you're just simply not getting enough opportunity to sleep. So, you know, we, we really a good way to address all this is is addressing whatever sleep issue that is there because again it affects our hunger hormones so you know we're more uh, we're, we're hungry we're not as uh, full and we uh, gravitate towards foods that are not healthy for us yeah and in terms of like the social media and the light exposure you know that delays our ability to fall asleep by mm -hmm. directly affecting um, hormones that regulate our sleep cycle so takeaway is really address um, whatever underlying issues, whether it's lack of sleep, disruption of sleep due to underlying medical problem, um, and make sure that you know we're, we're trying to um, be our best by really prioritizing it. You know, So many people shortchange the amount of sleep they get, mm -hmm. thinking they'll be more effective during the day or have more time during the day, but it just makes you, as you said, more uh, inattentive and mm -hmm. irritable and, and things like that. So. And I know we talked about the weight loss drug, Ozempic, just overall in you all's expertise, I guess, have people been coming to you all asking those questions about how can I get this? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Really? I mean, yeah. in the past few years, that is one of the most common visits in my primary care practice mm. is patients coming in almost knowing as much as myself about these drugs. So it's a very common conversation. And I honestly, I welcome it. Mm -hmm. um, we should be talking about it. So um, go in and, and speak to your providers. On another note, I think one of the things to recognize about obesity mm -hmm. and activity, which we've talked about as a group, mm -hmm. yeah. is that you can't exercise your way mm -hmm. out of overweight. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, exercise is really, really important. I don't want to minimize it. It's mm -hmm. super important for overall health and well-being but it isn't necessarily going to move the needle when it comes to being overweight. Uh, it will help maintain and keep your metabolism going. It's very important. Um, but the biggest factor in, in moving the number on the scale and improving weight is going to be changing eating habits. Mm -hmm. All right. So it's just those simple things to start implementing. What would you say is probably the simplest thing right now someone can implement within the next 20 minutes? Cut out sodas. Cut out, yeah, yeah. Right. cut out sugar and, sweetened beverages. Yeah. Yes. And, and yeah. reduce that that urge to supersize, right? You can easily supersize. It's not going to affect you financially. Like everything can be supersized. But, yeah. you know, we have to look at realistic portions. We are overdoing it with the amount that we eat. So. Well, there was recently a, a study done where in, in New York City they put a tax on sugar sweetened beverages. Mm. Mm. It, uh, it was a substantial tax. It reduced the rate. Um, at which people were consuming sugar sweetened mm -hmm. beverages and then they looked at rates of um, obesity and other conditions and mm -hmm. found a, a dramatic decrease not only in the rate of consumption of sugar sweetened beverages mm -hmm. but also in the rates of obesity and some of these other mm -hmm. conditions so just reducing that alone yeah. One factor is a huge one. I, I was going to say, really sodas, what about those, uh, you know, electrolyte drinks like Powerade, Gatorade, yes. things like that? Any yeah, sugar, yeah. Any sugar, sugar, sugar yeah. yes. Any Look at the ingredients. Look at the labels. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, definitely some good insight. What are some alternatives for people out there? <laughs> water. 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 Yes. Flavored water. Sparkling water. Sparkling water. Sparkling water. Yeah. Sparkling water. Sparkling water. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other Flavors. thing I would suggest yeah. is moving from the big dinner plate mm -hmm. to the medium dinner right. plate yeah. for every meal. Yeah. And that way you can still fill your plate, yeah. but, but fill it with uh, more appropriate portion sizes. Mm -hmm. hmm. 
And just, you know, minimize snacking, right? So, mm -hmm. so many people are working from home now, right? Yeah. And right. pantry's available, you can easily grab whatever you want. I mean, if you're a snacker, like, look at what you're consuming, right? So, most things that are in a pantry are not going to be good for you. If it's coming out of your fridge, fruits, vegetables, that's great, you know, but really look at what you're consuming. And it's, and we have to also factor in mood and depression, mm -hmm. right? So, a lot of people um, gravitate towards eating certain things when they, when their mood is a certain way. The term, uh, you know, comfort food is there for a reason, right? So, you know, we have to look at how that affects us too. All right, a great conversation for sure. We would like to thank all of our guests for their valuable insight. And thank you all for joining us here at CBS News Detroit. As a final reminder, Metro Detroit, please consult with your medical provider before making any changes to your diet or adding any medication to your routine.